Hello and welcome back to the final video of the build series of the Maki MC22 for Gore in 132nd scale from Italy. And in this one we are going to focus on priming, some painting, more painting, and some more painting, then some varnishing, tackling, weathering a tiny bit, and then it's done so get your modeling boots on boys because we are going to dive in right now but before i do anything let's see how the thing looks on the lazy susan in my paint booth and yeah everything is nice you can see that i've also used a bit of black primer as an undercoat for the canopy frames because this bird had its canopy frames painted black on the inside and a bit of gentle stroke to get the dust off. And now let's start blasting it with some Mission Models Grey Primer. Now the first coat is going to be just a light dusty one to help the second coat to get a better grip on the surface. I should also mention that before I started blasting the primer I cleaned the surface with some isopropyl alcohol. Now here comes the wet coat and I should point out a bit of a flaw in my process. Uh, as you can see I did kick up quite a lot of dust and cloud and that's because I used too high of a pressure. You don't need that with special emission models, paints and thinners. Just go roughly around 15 psi or 18 around those lines. And here I'm using a modeling stencil from Ushi van der Roosten to do this pre-shading kind of thing with Mission Models White. Now you can see me that I use uh, tissue paper to dab the stencil uh, from time to time. That's because, you know, water-based acrylics can accumulate on a surface and when they do and it gets a bit thick, then it has a hard time to dry and I just don't want to potentially risk having paint dripping from the stencil onto the model. Other than that, I think it's a reasonably simple process which can yield quite decent results, but let me know in the comments if you agree or disagree with this one. And after this pre-shading has dried, I started blasting Mission Bottles RLM65 Hellblow. And I'm trying to use here a uh, very thin, well, not very thin down, but I think I thinned it down like 50-50 or 60-40. And it's because I wanted to make multiple thin coats, multiple passes, so I can be sure that I, I'm going to be able to stop until I just barely see the underlying pre-shading so that it's not going to be lost on me completely with a complete full opaque coverage. And here is the end result. Probably you can't appreciate it that much due to the lighting and the angle and that that guy is not being able to hold it up in a way that you can actually see what's up, right? There you go, when I finally hit it. And now that has dried, we are diverting our attention to the upper surface where I use Zandgrau from Mission Models, which is the RAL7027. Now here as well, I try to do the same thing which I did for the underside, multiple thin layers, thin coats. But the thing is that after everything has been said and done and the dust or should I say the paint has settled, not much is going to be visible of the pre-shading on the top surfaces due to the multiple layers of paint and one of them being a very dark green. As some of you might point out, and I would say rightfully so at this point, that hey man, you are using all the wrong colors because the underside shouldn't be hell blow and the top surface base color shouldn't be this Zandgrau this is all wrong you are you are doing it wrong and like I would say yeah you are probably right but the thing is that the reason behind 
using these lighter colors is that when you put on a varnish especially like a satin or a matte varnish but in my case it's going to be satin varnish because matte doesn't look too good on planes in my opinion when you put that down it is going to darken the paint a bit and it is going to have a different shade and i think at that point it's going to be a bit more closer to the original one than if i would put down now the proper correct paint and then put the varnish on uh, uh, the shade would be different and i want to avoid that and of course let's not forget that the italians didn't have that kind of strict color schemes and and color palette as the germans or others had or at least i should say that's what i've heard so please don't shoot the messenger because i'm just saying what i've read and now that i finished the top surface let's focus on the biggest of them all and that's doing the camo scheme free-handed now by this time you probably know what kind of paint i'm usually using but let's reiterate it a bit this is the mission models olive green this whole camo scheme took me about uh, six hours uh, divided by two so i had a, a session around long as two and a half hours and the second session was like three three and a half at first i tried to replicate the one in the instructions but very soon i did realize that that's not going to happen so what i did was that i took a very big dose of i don't care medicine and man i should tell you that it works like magic i just started painting away without care in the world and of course because i myself am a human being as far as i know or at least the doctor said so I do need some external validation for my decisions and somewhere I did read that usually these planes were painted by multiple people and there were instances where one side of the plane looked a bit different than the other or at least these blotches or, or the camo scheme as it was painted on weren't that consistent which is quite understandable if Mario has a different way of painting the blotches than Luigi does both can have two different artistic styles am i right but anyway let's get back to the technical side of things and you might be asking a question okay okay so 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 you're doing this so what are the thinner to paint ratios what kind of pressure do you recommend and so on and so forth well first of all let me tell you that with the pressure thing i really can't give you an exact number i have that nice little mac 12 connecting to my airbrush which has used just to dial in the pressure by feels and by feels I mean that I blast air against the top of my hand and just check how high or low the pressure is and just go with that but if I would need to give you a number I would say that it's probably around 12 psi 10 12 psi when it comes to really close up close kind of painting which I do here and uh, thinner to paint ratio uh, if my memory serves me right i would say it was around 70 30 or 60 40 but but the good general rule here is when you do such work that the closer you get to the model with the airbrush the lower the psi should be and the thinner the paint should be that's about it i guess Oh, and before I forget, you might want to know what kind of needle size I use. That's a 0.12 needle size right there. Now you don't see it from here, but I can assure you that this technique that I use here is not 100% perfect. And in like any stretch of the imagination, because I did get a lot of spidering, which I had to try to work into the blotches then of course there was some overspray all the time which by the way is another thing why you might why you might want to go with a lighter color underneath because the overspray which you're going to have where these tiny olive green particulates will hit that brown part you know those are going to stain and darken the paint underneath so as I'm chugging along on the painting tracks, 
one might be wondering so why this camo scheme well the simple answer is that i think there are a lot of smoke ring schemes with this out in the wild because let's face it when we hear the word maki to to Fogore, which is well three words in this case we always think about the smoke ring camo pattern or perhaps the ones with the with those uh, tiny squiggly lines and tiny little specks of smoke as i should say but there aren't too many others right or at least not everybody goes with something different because that's just so iconic to the mackie and the truth be told i did have the urge to perhaps do it with the with the supplied decals because those are really nice but i thought to myself that i really need something that stands out a bit more so to speak and yeah i think this really does the job doesn't it and when i got this book which i do urge, urge you to get it if you don't have it yet if you're not a big Ma mackie fan but you have your eyes on the mackie to build it this book is quite good to give you some good information on the plane and give some examples of different types of camel schemes and and there is one particular called the herringbone which was used by the germans and i quite liked it but the problem was that i didn't have any kind of german markings in 130 second scale and frankly well you know my opinion about this kit how overpriced it is so spending 100 euros and then spending more on aftermarket stuff like extra decals and things like that i just didn't feel it justified and uh, there is a good chance that i wouldn't have used all of them and they would just be lying around and not being used at all there could have been the option to do it by hand i guess but by that time i just had my mindset on this camo scheme so i just went with this one and finally it's done now on to the next thing that i need to conquer and that is that big white stripe on the fuselage and to do that first i'm using tamiya's flexible masking tape i do quite like it because it's really good for following the curvature of the plane's body the fuselage body and uh, it's really easy to to fix any misalignment so if it's not perfectly vertical for example or, or horizontal or, or like anything like that it's really it, it's really easy to peel back and then reapply in the correct position which i did a number of times it is quite a time consuming thing to do so to speak uh, so you're not seeing all the hassle that it's just the very last steps really where i had everything uh, lined up properly now some of the eagle eyed amongst you might have spotted that a lot of these green blotches aren't really fully opaque well that's because maybe maybe my paint uh, paint technique is not perfect and i didn't want to risk to actually do a lot of uh, a lot of spidering and a lot of overspray so so yeah it is what it is i think it might give a bit more realistic vibe thinking about these things were probably made in haste just to get things out the door as fast as possible so it can go on the front and fight against the enemy i guess or it's just an excuse from me for my pan bad paint job but moving on now i am extending the masking a bit more because if i would just have that tiny little thin masking tape the flexible one on there there would be a lot of overspray to white paint and we don't want to have that now do we so i did extend it with some regular masking tape as you can see here and 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 for example this is the beauty using the flexible one as the main the main edge where you want to paint as as these kind of tapes the yellow ones aren't really flexible and they are really hard to control and get them to follow the curve 
but using these two together is like a match made in heaven. All done, so let's get into the painting. And of course, I use Mission Models White. And here as well, I do go nice and slow and very thin and very low with the pressure. And there are two reasons for doing this. One is to avoid any overspray with the really low pressure because you can see that I wasn't, wasn't covering the whole plane in masking tape. So with a high pressure, there is quite a, a high risk of getting the paint somewhere else where you don't want to have it. And the second one is that with any light colors, like for example, white in this case, or yellow, pink, or something like that, these are sometimes notoriously bad to build up nice opacity. So you want to do multiple thin layers. Like in this case, I did like four or five thin layers. And you can see the results. I think they speak for themselves. There is no overspray anywhere else. And, and yeah, and the coverage is really nice. It's just popping. It's just popping, my boys. Now let's glue in that big ass radiator underneath the fuselage. And the only thing I did, I just slobbered on some black primer. That's about it. And for the smaller radiator in the nose, I just painted the mesh with some gunmetal. Now I did check multiple sources whether the insides of the radiators and such places were the same green color as the cockpit you know that kind of interior greenish kind of color but apparently they were the same bluish grayish one as the bottom color of the plane now what i'm doing here because i had the radiator cover separate from the body it's time to glue them in so what i did is i scratched off the paint very carefully from the edges where i need the glue to get into here as well be very careful very mindful just to scratch back the paint a bit so the plastic on plastic contact is proper and there is no paint in between you don't have to do this though but sometimes i found that the glue has a bit of a harder time to do its magic if there is paint in between and of course here be very careful just to do a tiny little dot and let the the capillary action do the rest for you because you don't want to have the paint uh, being eaten up by the glue now similarly as i did with the small one I will do the same with the big one where I scratch the paint off from places where the upper part of the radiator will meet with the fuselage body. And of course, this guy almost forgot two crucial things from the insides of this radiator cover, which were the two rods controlling the radiator flaps, how open or close this, which by the way, is fixed. You can't really change that. And again, Italy, come on, man, fix this thing. Anyway, you meant to glue this onto the fuselage and then put the cover on, which wouldn't be a problem but it's just there is no way to make sure that the rods are the right length and they are not going to get crushed by the cover when you put it on and so on and so forth so now i am painting them up quickly with the same hell blow as i did with the underside i don't really do priming or anything because they aren't that visible but I just wanted to have them in there anyway. And you might also notice that the sides of the radiator block are gray plastic. That's because I had to sand it a bit 
as the fitting is quite tight so you want to make sure that that it's not going to give you any trouble when this part comes up where you actually have to fit the top cover onto the body but don't worry that is not going to be visible at all because it sits very flush against the cover as you can see it can hold the cover in place whilst i'm putting the glue down into the recesses now i'm pushing the cover down into its place do make sure that it goes all the way back far as possible because there can be a bit of a gap between the covers back edge those two edges on the side and between the fuselage and here is another issue for all you realists and that is that those two rods that control the flap doesn't really touch the flap at all there is a bit of a gap between those moving on i'm painting this radio mask with dark gray from ak interactive Now this is a great example why you want to make double sure, extra sure, triple sure or 200% sure what you're doing, double checking everything with even if you need a magnifying glass, do it, look at it, indulge yourself into the information on the instruction sheets because you don't want to end up like this guy. And what this guy did is that he accidentally masked off the gun ports in the wrong way and too much of those were painted with gun metal gray from mission model because only the insides of the gun ports should have been painted with gun metal the rest the top surface of it should be the camo scheme the paint job on the plane but in the end i just had a good look at it and thought eh, it's good enough I quite like it as it is and to be fair I'm a bit lazy and frankly I have to look at my own failure sitting on my shelves but after getting to terms with my failures I just went on and did the initial satin varnish from VMS and if you saw my previous videos you know very well that I'm a mission models guy 90% of the time and I do love mission models varnishes, but this satin varnish from VMS is the bee's knees. You are spraying it directly out of the bottle, no thinning needed, and the coverage is absolutely fantastic and it's tough as nails. It's a really good product. And sadly, I haven't been paid to say that, so these are really honest opinions. And now on to the decals. Look at them, they are gorgeous. I love the decals that they gave. It's like one of the best things of this kit or the decals so i am contemplating actually right now how and for what i could use these de decals for the rest of them because they are just so gorgeous it would be a waste not to use these decals they are so good now i'm just cutting out all the decals that i'm going to use and you might notice that i'm going to use the ones with the fascist symbols pre-armistice style and i know that the series 12 maki totos like this one that i'm doing now built by breda were having their fascist symbols icons marking being covered up because of the armistice as they rolled out of the factory but who wants a plain circle with nothing in it on the wings of the plane is just bland and frankly not that interesting if you want to have a plane a good looking plane post armistice style i would rather use those free color roundels those are much nicer than those gray circles which by the way aren't accurate because they weren't gray they, they just had the fascist symbols in the middle covered up but the circles were still black, so there is that. Now to make my plane look a bit more peculiar and out of the ordinary, I took these decals from Dustworks 
JUEF126LE, which is in my stash. And to use those red number ones as the squadron leader identification. Now the whole reasoning behind this crazy idea is that the camera scheme that I managed to do is so wildly different compared to the instructions that it's really not the same plane. So I think that in this case putting on the same numberings wouldn't make any sense because it is not that plain now, isn't it? So I came up with the idea to find in my stash anything that would resemble the same styling as the one the ones the squadron has for the numbers and these red ones are perfect for this in my opinion again your mileage may vary and yeah i just went with it and moving on to the deckling my biggest advice i would give here it's like this is my first time working with such big decals especially the roundels those are massive so you want to use as much setting solution as possible so don't be afraid slobber it on as there is no tomorrow my friend because you will need all the all the sliding capability of the setting solution to move these big decals in place because they can very easily uh, well, not rip and tear because they are not doing that. They are actually quite sturdy, to be honest, but they can really easily wrinkle on you. So just take your time and be gentle, you know, just like on your first date. And of course, this wasn't apparent with this first decal. That's why you don't see me slobbering too much. And it is going to be a bit hard for me to move around but eventually i do succeed but uh, it can wrinkle really easily it's very big but man these decals are fantastic they they respond to the setting solution and the softening solution really well they get into the little nooks and crannies really well I had the best experience with these decals and after I put down the satin varnish on top I cannot tell that these are decals these are so good so one would say that oh the other word was you can pull off the carrier film here the carrier film is so good so thin but still so sturdy that you have no problem my friend these are a plus great decals one of the best that I, I have I ever had the fortune to use and you can see me here that that I do try to put a bit more extra setting solution underneath so the wrinkles can you know get out uh, so the decal can stretch out and flatten down a bit more and don't worry about silvering either it's it's just not going to happen and uh, Yes, there is another thing that I want to say that don't try to use the cotton bud by, by like really pushing it down because it is going to wrinkle. So what I so what I did is rather trying to push out things from underneath the decal with the cotton bud, I actually took my time and I let the decal sit and dry itself out a bit when i saw that it is now really firmly in place and it's not going to move around and not going to wrinkle then i went over with a cotton bud and tried to push out any excess fluids or air bubbles or, or like anything from underneath but there there is no silvering whatsoever so just take your time be patient and let the softening the setting and softening solution do the work for you in this case. Trust me on this one. And in terms of the other decals, I'm not going to waste too much time talking about them or showing them how you have to put them on because they are in the size range of a, I would say, more common decal, which I think you would come across even if you haven't built any 132nd scale kits yet. They are going on as good as 
those big ones no problems at all you can even use the cotton bud early on to push out any excess fluid or air bubbles from underneath but again these are so good that you might not need it with these either but you can see me still doing that you know old habits die hard i guess now i would have loved italeri giving us that tiny coat of arms emblem separately from that white cross which goes on the rudder and the vertical stabilizer because it would have been much better to paint these on actually rather than having a two-part decal system but truth be told now well if it would be in focus you would say it looks a bit freakish because on that raised detail there is a lot of air being stuck underneath yeah now you can see so there is a lot of air alongside those little raised details underneath the decal but trust me those can go away really nicely you just have to be patient and use a lot of setting solution so don't go ham-fisted or anything on it don't go really hard because you can pierce the decal through with those raised details just use a lot of softening solution and it will be all okay of course you can see this guy now trying his luck but i i'm going to show you that he's not going to do this for too long and he's not going to damage the decals either but he just cannot stop poking the bear now he actually stopped good let's move on now i'm going to put on the red ones from uh, the dustwerk model now i don't know who made those decals for dustwerk maybe it's cartograph as well i have no idea but they are very same-ish in quality as the ones which came with this kit and i know i know it's not really the same in terms of style but it still looks good so i'm just keeping it sorry okay hold on hold on for a bit now because we are a bit too far ahead at this point so i haven't showed you that I did cut into the decals alongside the panel lines here and there to make them conform a bit more. So I should say that with a fresh exacto knife blade. And also this is the point where I already have the second layer of satin varnish down which seals all the decals in and covers them really nice. But let's continue with the schedule program which is how I've put in these exhaust ports that you can see here. Now, if you saw my previous video, I was complaining that I might have modeled myself into a corner by not putting in this a bit earlier, but that's not really the case. It's a bit finicky, but it is perfectly doable this way as well. And let's see how it's done. And the trick is to cut down the knobs and send them on the side and if i could focus a bit better come on come on focus and there we go so now you can see that those knobs were twice the size before sanding and cutting so i positioned them in place the very first one and then i just push it into its hole like that now the second one and i should mention that i haven't been gluing anything just yet so what i do i put all of them in just having them in dry fitted don't worry they are not going to fall out they can fit in there quite snugly now after you have everything fitted in the gluing is going to be a bit tricky you have to use Tamiya Extra Fin 
to be able to reach inside with the fin applicator they have or potentially you could use like slow drying cement on there which you put on the knob first and then put it into its place that could work i use tamiya extra fin and really carefully apply the glue through the opening between the cowling and the engine and the results speak for themselves And here I do apologize that I don't have any footage of me painting the props, but let me give you the rundown. The base is Mission Models Black Primer. The middle section is AK Extreme Metal Steel. And the ends of the props is painted with Mission Models Insignia Yellow. And I almost forgot to mention that before I put down the yellow, I do put down some Mission Models White as well, which helps the yellow to be more vibrant and uh, it helps with its opacity. And before the decaling process, everything was sealed in with VMS Satin Varnish. And directing my attention towards the rear landing gear, the only landing gear that is going to be visible in this case, I used the AK Extreme Metal Steel. And for the tire itself, I used Mission Models Tire Black. And just for the sake of old times, I went back to the insides of the plane and painted the gun barrels with gun metal. Guns need to be painted with gun metal and that's just the hard fact. And with that out of the way, I can finally say that everything is done in terms of the engine and the guns. So let's focus on something else which is the panel lights and for that I'm using AK's panel liner for brown and green colors Now the thing is that the ones that I'm using here I think they are not making it anymore on their official website you can see these new bottled ones which are very interestingly look same-ish to the Tamiya ones I do want to try them but to be fair you don't need that much of a panel liner and I had these for years and been using them quite quite a lot if I'm not using oil paint I am using these uh, I still have a lot I don't think they are going to run out anytime soon in my lifetime unless I have a bit of an accident perhaps a bit of an oopsie with them so I can justify to buy the new ones mm, we shall see now usually regarding the technique of panel lining I would follow the slobber it on as there is no tomorrow kind of technique which is really good not just to highlight panel lines and fine detail but to give a more dirty grimy realistic look for the plane really killing two warbirds with one stone but here I really felt like I don't want to slobber that much I want to follow the less is more technique in this case because I want to keep a more cleaner look to the plane to have the feel that it is a relatively brand new plane which haven't seen that much action yet and of course because at this point I was quite exhausted with this project and a lot of mojo has been killed during the time so I just wanted to be done and I felt like that if I would spend way more time 
on these things like weathering and, and like, like post shading and all this stuff i would just really lose my mind at this point i just want to have it done in a state which i am happy to look at and it looks good on my shelf in the end everything comes down to fun and what you want to accomplish within the hobby if you want to go super realistic Saiyajin, go and do that but if you have like a good enough mentality like most of the times I do, then go and do that. The world of scale models shall be your oyster, my friend. And as usual, after I waited half an hour, hour or so, I broke out my trusty Q-tips and started rubbing like crazy. And of course, as a regular advice in these instances, when you come across a very stubborn stain of enamel or oil paint, you can always go and use some white spirit or turpentine where you dip the Q-tip into it just a tiny bit and then rub the excess off. Here you can see me using a brush which was just very briefly, just for a brief handshake, introduced to to Mr. Turpentine so we can soften up that edge a bit and getting rid of the excess paint. Also the usual thing when what I say here is that take your time because enamel or oil paints take a long 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 as time to cure so just saying you don't need to rush just put on your favorite music or favorite podcast or perhaps your favorite uh, youtuber <clears throat> well never mind instead let's talk more about the varnish i do want to praise it here because it's just so resilient i was rubbing like a maniac as you can see although it's uh, well this is not my actual speed and it just didn't really even flinch and the reason why I'm saying this is because I did have, from time to time, the experience of rubbing too much in that uh, the varnish started to come off and started to damage the paint as I was trying to get rid of uh, the excess weathering and panel line wash. And uh, that can easily happen to all of us, I think. And yeah, this varnish, this is really good stuff my boys it's really good i was rubbing 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 and it was holding onto the surface as as if its life depended on it and well frankly it probably did but anyway i give credit where credit is due and i think this varnish really deserves a lot of praise because this is one of the most resilient ones i I've, I've come across yet i'm not saying that there aren't any better ones but if you're looking for a water-based varnish which is tough and resilient and gives a nice coverage without having to bother with thinning or anything this one is for you my friend this is this is really it but to give a bit of negative feedback as well on the product is that when you have in a situation where you for example have masking down and after you put down the varnish and you want to peel off the masking for example when you do the canopy and this happened to me actually so when you peel off the masking sometimes the varnish doesn't separate really well along the edge of the masking tape and it does peel off and brings the paint with it but that's probably due to the fact that when you have water-based acrylics and uh, very slippery surface of the canopy plastic the clear plastic and it doesn't doesn't uh, stick to it well it comes off really easily anyway so that's something that you might want to keep in mind but turning back to the regular program here you can see me using a bit more turpentine a bit generously to soften up the enamel paint and move it around to the crevices and around the raised details so it gives a bit more of a stronger edge highlight to it now i clear up the surface to glue in this uh, this targeting 
reticle kind of thing which is in front of the canopy and it is outside the reason why i left it until then because it's a tiny tiny piece as you can see and it easily easily can be broken off whilst you are, whilst you are handling the plane and then it can end with the worst scenario possible where you actually fed it to the carpet monster and you will never see that piece ever again only perhaps after two years when you don't need it anymore anyway And here is how the landing gear looks after the satin varnish and panel line wash. And of course this means that it can finally go into its final place. And to do that I use not regular plastic cement but CA glue aka super glue. And here you can see the final result. Now let's concentrate on the radio wire. But before we can do that, let's have a look at the first two insulators. The first one, I wouldn't recommend using it because the insulators themselves are like tubes of which the cable runs through. The same as the second one, but the second one has like this uh, bulky thing at the start. But apart from that, it's uh, a tubular kind of setup as well, which has the cable running through it. But of course I should say that this is what I saw on reference images and other places. So if you know better how these work and what they do and like how they are set up, then please let me know in the comments. So let's have a look at the one that is close to the radio mast behind the cockpit. You can see that the instructions tell you to loop the wire around both ends. Well. This is the problem, it's not like that. The wire, ha the wire has to run through it. And in order to do so, I replaced that plastic part with the copper tubes from Albion Alloys. Now let's go and have a look at the one that is close to the vertical stabilizer. At this one as well, you can see that the back should have copper wire around it, but the front part, that nipple thing, <laughs> nipple that has the copper wire attached to it directly or at least that's what the instructions say and to be honest that's that's a thing that no CA glue will hold it in place if the wire is under tension especially this is why I would recommend you to do the following cut off the nipple cut off the back rod side drill through that bulky thing make a hole big enough to fit through a copper tube then glue it that in and run the wire through it and i think that would be the closest thing to the actual installation in real life but again if you know better if you have more information on this thing please let me know in the comments and now you can see that this guy really didn't do what i just said or at least not with the part that is close to the vertical stabilizer so what i did here is that i looped the wire around and i glued it in place Now here is the part where I'm cutting off that nip nip and there she goes. Now I'm drilling in a hole due to the realization that I will need to have a hole in there for a tiny bit of copper tube to fit into. I use my trusty electric drill bit that can be charged via USB cable. Now I am positioning the tiny piece of copper tube at the end of the wire I'm using CA glue to hold it in place. Sorry about the focus loss, but by, by at this point you should be used to this thing from me. Let's hope in the future it's going to be less and less, but there we are. 
See, that's the tiny piece of copper tube that should replace the nipple like so. And now I glue it in place. But again, as I said before, if you go and drill that whole thing through and you run a big, a bigger, longer copper tube through it, then you will have a much better time than I did with this one. And whilst I was trying to find the words that I wanted to say, you saw me cutting that first insulator copper tube to size according to that tiny plastic piece it's supposed to replace. Now you saw me feeding the wire through the first insulator, which is close to the radio mast, and then I fed the wire through the radio mast uh, hole and then I went back in a loop into that first insulator again and I pulled it all the way to the radio mast as close as possible because that's where it should be and this is actually how it looked on some of the reference, reference images which I saw on the internet. And after I've cut the hanging bit to length I use some CA glue to fix everything in place, including the bottom, the hanging part to the insulator that is sticking out of the fuselage. And this is how it looks. I think by this point everybody knows the drill before you can paint anything on metal you want to do the metal primer from Mr. Hobby. And after that has dried I went over the wire with dark grey from AK Interactive. And whilst I had this paint at hand, I also went and colored in that, that targeting reticle outside of the canopy. Uh, the instructions say that it should be black, but I don't really want to use full blown black on it. I wanted to have a bit of lighter shade and I think this dark gray, it's really nice for these kind of situations. The two insulators at the start and the end of the wire, they were painted white and uh, their ends were painted a light grayish color. Here I'm using this light gray, very light gray colored panel liner from the same old version AK panel liners and I do this kind of mottling staining effect on the props. In the end, I think I might have overdone it a bit. I should have been more subtle with the effect, but it was a good exercise. And that's pretty much the result whilst drying. And we are at the final stretch, boys. Here I'm using Tamiya's weathering set to do some exhaust staining. I use the black and the rust. I think the black is called soot and well, rust is rust. But I've been pointed out that these kind of stains aren't usually just simple black. They do have some variations to them and which is quite frankly true. So I thought that I'm going to use a bit of rust in the mix as well to give it a bit more of a, of a brownish undertone for it. And first I'm doing the bulk of the work with that uh, little brush that they supply with this feathering set to rub all over the soot and uh, rust staining. And now I'm using these silicone sculpting brushes, sculpting pens, to rub more of that black soot into the 
exhaust port and on top of them. And after I finished feathering, I used a soft big brush to get rid of all the excess. Now using another Tamiya Weathering Master set, which has sand, light sand and mud in it. I go and use some mud on the rear landing gear to make it a bit more dirty. And pretty much that's about it. It's done. Finally, it's done. <sighs> it was a long-winded one, wasn't it? Now, I promise I can produce short videos. You can see my other builds like the Sturmovic or the Regiana 2000. Those are much shorter and it is from the beginning to the end. But let me know what you like in the comments. Do you like big multi-part builds? Or do you like shorter videos like 20-40 minute video with from start to end? But let's not waste any more time. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the fully built Makito 2 for Gore from Italeri in 130 second scale. And it is a yay indeed. Well, for me at least, it is absolutely gorgeous. I like it, how it turned out. Regardless of all the shortcomings of the kit, I think it is a decent kit. Again, I could go on about all the problems, but I promise I'm not going to. All I'm going to say is that if you love the Mackie, too much as I do and you want it in your collection then yeah go for it buy it it's your money by the end of the day but if you are not too fussed about not having this in your stash then I would rather wait until it gets cheaper I don't think this kit will go anywhere because apparently it sold like hotcakes in the very first few weeks but, but anywho this is my final result hope you like it in the future there is a winter is coming theme in the making which is the ju87 stuka the g2 variant in winter colors and i am already building it i don't know when the first video is going to drop but i am trying to be more consistent with you know time frames and everything in the meantime you might see some review video videos from me or similar things but yeah what i always say at the end you know please like and subscribe leave a comment and see you on the next one